So this morning, I salute each and every one with the honorable and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you. To the bishop, I salute you with the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. To the deacon of the house, to every leader, every individual in their respective place, I salute you with the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace this morning. Amen. But in that, after all the salutations that you give to each and every individual in their respective places, there is still a word from the Lord this morning. Amen. And not only a word from the Lord, but as I usually say, there's a revelation from the Lord. And in that, for those who have been on the same spiritual channel with us last week, uh, today I, I do part two of the word that the Lord gave in the midst of time last week. Amen. Uh, so for those that still have the word of the Lord with them on this morning, if you would kindly turn back with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're focusing once again with all of our attention on verses 1 through 7. Amen. Amen. So once you have found it, please signify if you can by saying, men of God, I got it. And if you're able, at least for those that are here in my presence to stand, please do so. Amen. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through seven. And let me read this to you to place it in your hearing to once again get you in the correct trajectory for part two of today's message. Amen. And the word declares thus, and I'm reading to you all from the standard King James Version. And it states, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Once again, as the title was given on last week, I speak it into each and every one's hearing once again. Don't let ungodly character deny you of godly power and truth. Don't let ungodly character deny you of godly power and truth. You may be seated in his presence. And I say this again, don't let ungodly character deny you of godly power and truth. Good morning to the church. Good morning to body of believers. And good morning to those who may be hearing for the first time and seeking from the Lord. Uh, as, as stated and as postured in last week's message and as a continuation this morning, the Lord is once again still dealing with us regarding his character. Amen. But as I mentioned in last week's message in the beginning, I had to throw you a boomerang. I had to throw you a curveball. Uh, if I may use that cliche of saying in order to say there's something a little different that had to be thrown out to you. As we have been marching with the Lord from January of 2021 up until now, as we've crested into the month of September, the ninth month of the year, uh, the Lord has still been dealing with us regarding his character. And in that, it's a thing that it's not just to know of his character, 
but for us to understand his character and experience his character in order to be part of our perfecting or maturing process as individuals in these earthen vessels. Amen. But here is what seemed to have been uh, a possible problem for some individuals. Because no matter how much you drive home, what is the characteristics of the Lord God, if you don't tell people what's not the characteristics of him, we have a tendency to be mixers. And when I say mixers, the thing is we began to blend what's ungodly in with what's godly and now we've grayed the lines. We've, we've caused things to be murky that we now no longer can identify what's godly and what's not. Because, see, understand, according to the world, there's, there's some things that may be good but aren't God. And in the same, thing, same turn, excuse me, there's a lot of things that are godly that may not look good. So, so in that, I posture that to continue the thought for many to hear what I am saying, because see, if we never take an assessment of what's incorrect, we will never be able to identify and we'll begin to continue to merge what's ungodly or what's unright in character with the life that we're living. And see, based upon what I gave as the title, it's ungodly character that causes us to deny the power that the Lord has for us when we're in godly character. It's ungodly character that causes you to be blinded and not be able to see the truth. So as we, we understand that now, as we're still building, last week I was able to address the first three verses of the chapter. Amen. And now, as I kind of do a quick snapshot of that, I also remind you of what was the subject at the beginning of the chapter. When you look at verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul, who we're believing is the writer, tells us, he says, Know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, remember, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to give you a spiritual conversation this morning. I'm trying to give you a spiritual dialogue regarding what the writer has said. As he says, I need you to know, he's saying, I need you to understand. Mm -hmm. See, some people only want to be in the know, mm -hmm. meaning you got the information, but yet you don't do anything with the information to understand it in order to put it into action. So what I'm telling you this morning, still in a spiritual conversation, the writer says, I need you to know or understand what I'm about to say in order for you to apply what revelation and illumination I'm giving you. Amen. So now in that, the writer brings to our attention, he says, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, as I said last week, many of us look at that and we automatically default to the end of the world. We, we automatically default to end time prophecy, which I, I'm not saying anyone is in error with that. But if I can touch your theology again, just a little bit this morning, you have to also consider that what he is uh, addressing is in your time of denial of your flesh. Listen to what I'm saying. The time that you are in denial of your flesh. Because the word days is eschatos, which means to be at the finality or the extremity. And then when it says uh, hemera in, in Greek, it means from abstaining or to separate yourself. What are we saying separate yourself from other than perilous times, which means difficult opportunities, difficult seasons. I'll let you think about that for a minute. So what the writer brings to our attention as I continue to set the platform, the, the, the issue that's at hand when it comes to character in part two of this message 
is for you to recognize that as long as you say that you're on a journey of being a believer in the Lord, your journey is going to cause you to meet a bumpy place in the road. And the bumpy place in the road is when you have to stretch yourself in a place of denying your flesh on the journey. See, many of us start the journey even when we say, I give my life to the Lord. You still are, are making an acknowledgement that you want to start the course, but your flesh hasn't fully been delivered. And since your flesh is not fully delivered, then that means the journey that you're on is going to require your flesh to be challenged. The inner man or your soul or your spirit man is what's really on the journey. It's not your physical body. It's your body is only the vehicle that's carrying your spirit man in the journey in this temporal life. And while you're on this journey in your temporal life, what's happening is the fact of a determination is being made. Are you going to be God-like or are you going to be worldly? Are you going to be according to the spirit of God or are you going to be according to the nature of the flesh? So that means going forward in your life, every decision that you make when you claim that you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and the Lord God as your father and the spirit as your guide, then what you are implying in, in small, small letters uh, uh, or should I say, in the fine print of your life, you're saying that I am going to take this journey of the process of cutting me out of the picture. Now, what is cutting you out of the picture other than something that is significant? The thing that has to be worked and fixed in you is your character. Many of us are, 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 are focusing on letting self be gratified in the process. But the thing is, the gratification that the Lord gets out of you being changed is when your character is changed to be like his. It's not that you just said, I'm going to be part of the family. He wants you to be part of the family looking like him. But see, to look like him is to act like him. To act like him is to be in his character. That is what the transformation process, when we talk New Testament wise as the new church, that's what he wants to fix in you. That's what Jesus comes into your life to deliver you from. He comes to deliver you from you. Most of the times you are your own devils because it's your character that's warring against you. It, notice that when you get in godly character, notice how smooth things work for you with the Lord. The only thing that comes against you or rails against you is a characteristic that doesn't match him. And so now it puts you at a crossroads. Am I going to stay in godly character or am I going to shift and allow myself to stay in a characteristic that the world has already groomed me in that I'm so comfortable at living by that I, I, I don't have to even think twice about it. I know that's probably an ouch moment for somebody that's listening to me, but that's why we find ourselves as believers, no matter how holy we are, no matter how religious we are, no matter how spirit-filled we are, notice that we have an, uh, uh, an ability to default back to who we were yesterday. Right. Oh, okay, brr, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me get real with folks, how you was just did he. Uh, uh, because the, the yesterday you is still you being you. The, the tomorrow you is you supposedly being him because you're supposed to always be on the course that something is changing in you for the better. Amen. But I, I, I'm hopefully giving everybody an aha moment. What, what has to change for the better is your character. So, so now, now. If, if I can still continue to set the platform for everyone to understand, that's why I believe Paul in this passage begins to give us really the fruits, plural, of, of the flesh. And what he deals with is what your character look like. As we touched in, 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 in verse, verse 2 through verse 3, we talked about uh, loving ourselves, being selfish, 
That's, that's not in the character of the Lord God. That's in your own self. We, we, we talked about being covetous, meaning that we have a desire for the wealth of the world, but not the wealth of the Lord God. And I touched last week that the wealth of the Lord God is his word. If, if that's not so, according to the book of Matthew, as I said in the previous message, it said, lay up your treasures in heaven. And what's very profound, that word treasure is thesaurus in the Greek. What is a thesaurus other than a form of a dictionary of words or variances of words? So then my, my treasure or my value in the Lord God is what word I have in me that I lay up in invisible or spiritual places. So my value in in the earth is based upon what words that I have valued in heavenly places. But many of us have ourselves dialed in according to the world to say I'm only worth something depending on how much I got in the bank. That's worldly character. We, we, we touch being boasters. And, and as I said about boasters, boasters are pretenders. Boasters are braggers. You brag about things, but yet the things you brag about, you got to be fake in the process. This is probably still an aha moment for some that are listening to me, whether I ministered it last week or I touch it this week. It's still real because that is what is systemic, not only in the body of Christ, but it's in the body of the believer, which is why Paul brings it to our attention. He says, hey, if, if, if you're going to examine yourself, if you want to be a doctor for yourself, try examining your character. He, he addresses us being boasters, Bishop. He addresses us being proud or being prideful. He, he addressed us being blasphemers. And, 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 and being blasphemers, like I said, that was probably something that caused some people to tighten their jaw when I touched it. But I'll touch it again. Being a blasphemer is more than someone slandering the name of the Lord God when you cursing. Uh, uh, being a blasphemer is you not acting in the character of the Lord God that you claim that you have. That's how you uh, blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to be separating yourself or dedicating yourself to the Lord, but yet you allow the character of flesh to be mixed with that, that the Lord God says, that ain't me. You've made yourself a spiritual hybrid that's operating in the earth. When you try to mix the spirit of the Lord God with the spirit of the world, he says, that's not me. You become, once again, as I said before, your own demons. You become your own abomination that causes you to be stuck in between realms. You're not having authority for the spiritual realm, and you're not operating in full power in the earth realm. It's because you're caught in between. That's just like what demons are right now. If I can touch some folks' theology about who demons are. They're, they're, they're hybrid type spirits that are stuck. They can't go to heaven, but yet they can't rest in the earth. So they torment folks who still have the characteristics that match them. Why do you think that there is something in you that causes demons to want to possess you? If I could be a physicist for a moment, amen, as a physicist, you would understand that the body is composed of matter, but it's also composed of antimatter. Every molecule of your body that makes up something physical is matter, but every molecule is glued together by antimatter. And antimatter is the negative energy or the negative characteristic that's in you that causes you, even when you get mad, to implode. So, so in that, if I continue to entertain negative energy, negative character, then what happens, demonic entities begin to lick their chops. They began to look at you and say you become tasty because you are conducive for them to operate in. So they began to operate in you because you have denied the character of being holy in the Lord God and say, I want to mix ungodly character in my nature. I hope I'm still teaching somebody something this morning. So he says, you, you blaspheme me. You allow, you allow unrighteous spirituality to operate in you when you're in bad character. He says, 
also, as we touch, ungodly character is about being disobedient. Watch this to parents. It didn't say, as I said last week, disobedience just as a solo word. It said disobedience to parents, meaning parents are meant to be those that are in your life to help build you, to help nurture you, to help establish you in the character of the Lord God. So how is it that we have the audacity that we don't want nobody to cover us? How is it that we have the audacity that we don't want anybody to build us? How is it that we have the audacity that we don't, as we say, come home? Okay. Maybe because there's silence of people missing at home because they are in a rebellious state of being obedient. I'm just saying, and, and, and that just ain't talking this church. I'm speaking towards every ministry, every church that represents the Lord God, because the church is supposed to be the home. The word says never forsake assembling yourself, because the assembly is for you to come home in order for you to have parenting given to your life by someone that represents the spirit of the Lord God in order to give you right character. Isn't it when you was at home that is where you learned manners? Isn't it when you was at home that you sat at the dinner table and somebody at least told you what you do with the fork, the spoon, and the knife? Wasn't it somebody that told you about not hitting the glass or or putting your elbows on the table? I know I'm talking truth this morning, but I'm giving you a reality of something in the natural that you can associate with. And see, what happens is many people are rogue in the world doing things that claim they got godliness, but yet they do stuff that's ungodly or is without etiquette, if I can use right terms. So in that, it's because, watch this, we will say they ain't got no manners. Some will go old school and say they ain't got no home train. Others of us will say they ain't had the right parents in their life in order to nurture them to do the right thing in the right place at the right moment with the right person. The word still says ungodliness speaks itself to, to, to unthankfulness. And y'all, I'm going to get to the new material on today. But like I said, some people missed the channel last week. So I want to make sure you, 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 you know exactly where we're going when we're dealing with ungodly character. Because sometimes some folks need to hear it a couple of times in order to check themselves. Uh, a, a, a man, it brings accountability. So to, to be unthankful, meaning we, we, we get into a place of being ungrateful. We get into a place of being unpleased. The Lord God says, this, this shouldn't be in the character of somebody that represents me. This is in the character of you representing yourself. Because see, unfortunately, here's where the problem lies with that characteristic. It's due to the fact since we have choice in things, now we begin to personify our views on our choice. You think about that for a moment. The things that you are ungrateful for or against is because even though you had choice, you, as the old folks used to say, began to smell yourself and began to say, not only do I not like this, I'm going to let everybody know that I don't like it. Okay, y'all, y'all know you get jazzy with, with, with what you've been given a choice in. See, but you got to understand even in humility, if I've got the character of the Lord God, even in humility, I ain't got to open my mouth to express what, what I don't appreciate. If that ain't so, I could have swore when Jesus was on trial, both by the Sanhedrin as well as by Pilate, the record states he never said a mumbling word. Now, I know he couldn't have liked what they had to say, what they had to represent, i.e. of the character of the adversary, but he didn't have to uh, 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 acknowledge it with saying something. He actually would tell them, you said it. Okay, so somebody should have learned something right there, unless I'm talking to the ceiling fans and the lights. Everything that goes against you does not need to be acknowledged to give it authority in this reality to work against you. 
including the character that is ungodly in nature. He says on holiness, which we, we don't consecrate ourselves. We don't dedicate ourselves anything. How many of us right now that's under the sound of my voice have really dedicated yourself to anything? I like how, how me and the men, we were having a conference call on yesterday, and one of the men of God was defining the difference in commitment versus dedication. Okay. And, and, and the man of God was, was saying, he said, some people may be committed to something, but that don't mean they dedicated to something. See, see, many that's listening to me right now, you committed to going to a job nine to five. You, 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 you committed to going to the store every week. You committed to, to, to doing everything that has worldly flavor to it. But then the question is, in all that, what's, what, are, what do you have a dedication to? Is there anything that convicts you? To say, regardless of what's going on, I'm going to do this. See, dedication is something that speaks to godly character. Lack of dedication is something that does not. The word says lack of natural affection. And as I said, we, we, we find ourselves, me, myself, and I, us four and no more. We, we find ourselves feeling as we have coined it in the clinical arena as being introverts versus being extroverts. Uh, but while we continue to entertain the introvert, what we come to discover for those who know anything even in the clinical arena, even as an introvert, if you're not careful, it leads you to depression. And what does depression do? Some instances, depression can lead you to have suicidal ideations, having thoughts of eliminating yourself. So, so here's the thing. What's in, in godly character is for us to, to be one that wants to connect. Be one that wants to not only be on the journey of perfecting ourselves in the character of the Lord God, but also not be selfish and look at your brother and your sister on the right or some that ain't even in the family yet and say, hey, let me take them up and assist them on the same journey. Some don't know that their character is flawed. But it takes you to be on the journey in the Lord to recognize what needs to be fixed in character. You to be able to delineate what's good character versus bad character in order to not only help yourself but help others. Some are truth breakers, as we said. Some are false accusers. Some are incontent, meaning they ain't got no self-control. Some are fierce, meaning they savages. They Neanderthals. They, they, they are beasts in nature because they have no spiritual mindset to gauge the direction that they go. I know some right now that are listening to this can probably say, yeah, I feel that because I'm still dealing with it. Uh, 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 some we find are despisers of those that do good. And when I say despisers, not only do you hate individuals that are a benefit, you find yourself in a place that you want to oppose them. Meaning you want to be uh, 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 the Satan in the situation. You want to be the Satan in, in the relationship. Because now it means that your character is to be an opposer. Your character is to be an opponent. Why is it that we think that we got to be an opponent to everybody that we come across in life? There should be something in our life that says, hey, out of the character of the Lord God, I ain't trying to be your enemy. I'm trying to be your brother. I'm not trying to fight against you. I'm trying to fight for you. I ain't trying to be uh, uh, one that makes you a victim. I'm trying to make you a victor. So now it brings us to where I left off. Verse 4, if I can still give you a little bit more meat on today. Verse 4 says, traitors, heady, high-minded, lover of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Now, in the reality of the matter, when you look at this, isn't it interesting that Galatians chapter 5, verse 20 through 23, talk about the fruit of the Spirit, which is really the characteristics 
of the Lord God. It lists nine. Amen. For those that are Bible readers. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. But isn't it interesting, just in this text alone, there's 18. Mm. So for every, as I look at it, if I could be a mathematician for a moment, every good character associated with the Lord God, there's at least two bad characteristics that associates itself with the ungodly. So that tells me there's always going to be squeeze play. When you're looking to do good. Ah, some, somebody had an aha. Because now, now you get a revelation when Paul said, when I seek to do good, evil is always present. There's, there's always characteristic that war with what character you're operating in. If nobody had that prophetic revelation, have your prophetic station break right now and know that every time that you posture yourself to be in the character of the Lord God, there's one or two characteristics that's going to war against that or try to invalidate that character so that you don't walk it out, walk it through, or cause it to mature in your life. Because, see, the more that you let godly character mature, in your life, notice the easier that some things get. Why is it that it gets easier? It's because as we even say the cliche, practice makes perfect. The more that you practice something, the more you get good at it. And the more that you get good at it, the things that resist you no longer are uh, an issue. They're no longer in the mathematical equation to cause you to have to scratch your head and get into a struggle as to how to do what you're doing. It's when you don't practice something that causes you to get into a quandary that now what you should be practicing is not working effectively for you because you ain't spent enough time with it. Ungodly character will deny you your power and your truth. So Paul says one godly Ungodly, excuse me, one ungodly character that you'll deal with is being a traitor. Uh, now, some may be looking at me hard right now. I can't see you on Facebook Live, but you're probably looking at me real hard and tough right now. You say a traitor. I, I, I know some people had attitude with it. Traitor. Here's, here's the thing I want to give you, though, about the characteristic of being a traitor. The Greek word that's used in this text is Prodotes. And prodotes means a uh, betrayer. It means one who forsakes. It means one who's not dedicated. It means one who surrenders. Okay, so, so watch this. If... I am in the character, anyone of the characteristics of the Lord God. It's when I compromise the character of Kim for the character of the world that I default to, that now I'm practicing betrayal. See, some of us think betrayal only works when it comes to people that we got a relationship with. Y'all know, some, some people have shortchanged it because you look at where, where Judas betrayed Jesus because you're only looking at the physical. But you, nev you never look at where everybody else, including Peter and the boys, betrayed him as well. You just seen the physical betrayal. But see, betrayal is when you start a thing with something, but then you don't see it through. Betrayal is, is or should I say being a traitor, is when you forsake or put down what you claim that you picked up. Being a traitor is when you surrender the authority and the mindset that you had invested in something to do something else. So many of us 
are operating as traitors when we don't even know it because we have not looked at that characteristic in its depth to see how it applies to us. Somebody probably say ouch right now. Everybody's giving Judas up the road, but then we haven't seen where we've been our own Judas unto the character of the Lord God. So every time that we pick up his character and say, I'm going to run with this thing, I'm going to live this thing. But yet we let other characteristics get in the way and we say, let me put that down for a minute. And then we even had the audacity to say, that ain't me. Okay. The next characteristic that the writer mentions is being heady. Propetes is the Greek word. And it means to fall forward. Watch this. Fall headlong. Or to be reckless. Now, now I, I bring those different variations of the definition out of the Greek out. Because notice who I brought up regarding being a traitor. Judas. And if y'all remember in the book of Acts, it says that he fell headlong. Okay, watch this. If I can give y'all a sidebar prophetic revelation, not only did he fall headlong or head first, it said he fell as a traitor. Yes. He, he, he fell because he had a heady type of characteristic over his life that yoked him to these other characteristics. See, what happens is when we let these other characteristics get in the way, it causes us to be, as part of this definition, reckless. And see, being reckless still does not line up with the Lord because Throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we find that the Lord is associated with peace. Mm -hmm. And what is peace other than not just tranquility, but order? So if, if you're living a reckless life and that is your passion, then you're already denying the character of the Lord God of being in peace and in order. You're saying, I want this ungodly characteristic to be labeled upon me because I like living like this. And see what happens is it even opens up the door of the next negative characteristic that we find here in the text. It talks about being high minded. What is being high minded other than being foolish, other than being stupid, other than being insolent due to uh, uh, being blinded by our pride? That's what high-minded is, according to the scripture. We operate in foolishness, and to operate in foolishness, to me, it means to be godless. Y'all remember Jesus said, don't call your brother a fool. Yeah. All right? Because the word fool in the Greek is moros, which means godless. When I call them that, then I'm denying the God that can exist in them. So in that, what he says is when you're high-minded, you're operating like you ain't got no sense. You're operating without the character of the Lord God being enthroned in your, your mental so that he can guide you and lead you in his character so he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You look like me and you're truly a son to me, meaning you're one that's living a life that builds my name before other people or builds my character. As long as you're in a reckless life, as long as you're prideful in your thinking, he says, then you're acting in foolishness. And while you're acting in foolishness, then that means you're, 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 as we say, spiritually stupid, meaning you have no sense. You're operating toward godly sense. I mean, excuse me. You're operating towards ungodly sense versus godly sense. Then he says, you have the ungodly character of being lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So 
in this, what he's saying, one of the things that becomes significant and some probably are looking to their left and their right and now starting to look within themselves. Man, do I find myself loving pleasure more than I do the, lo the Lord God? Because if I love pleasure more, it means that I'm fond of satisfying my flesh. When I love pleasure more, I'm fond of satisfying me. And see, unfortunately, the world conditions us as human beings about living a life to be satisfied. But where in the world's lingo does it talk about living a life that satisfies the Lord so that you're satisfied? Ah, that's, an, that's another tier in the process that some haven't considered. We want to say as long as at the end of the day, I had a good time. As long at the end of the week, I, notice I is big in this. But not putting the Lord first to say, what would the Lord be satisfied in that I do? And what can I do to make the Lord satisfied so that I feel satisfied based on Kim being satisfied. Have we ever postured ourselves to say that? Oftentimes, no. Because once again, ungodly character is denying us our power and truth. See, watch this. As you look at verse 5 here, notice that the writer, after he gives you all of these different ungodly characteristics that war with you trying to be godly, mm -hmm. he says, you have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Okay. What is he what is what is he saying to us here? The writer, I believe, acknowledges that even though you're on the journey as a believer, you've got some shape or resemblance of being godly. However, he says you're denying the power in that shape. Now, wait a minute. What's go you know, some will probably listen to me right now and say, well, then what's going on with me? And as I was prepping for this part two, the Lord gave me a definition here. And the definition that he gave me was in regards to saying there's a difference between being a good person and a God person. Uh, uh, there's a difference. Because y'all know some, some of us that are believers, you work with people, you go to school with people, live by people. And they say, I'm a good person. I don't believe the way you believe. And I don't believe the God that you believe in. But I'm a good person. Y'all have heard that. So, as the Lord was speaking to me, I, I wrote this definition down that he gave me. He said, a good person lives by some of the characteristics or qualities associated with me without me being the source of the reason. While others who are ungodly live by some of the characteristics associated with me, but also by the ungodly characteristics or qualities 
in which the adversary is the driving source of reason. Hmm. So what happens is, is the reason we label good people good versus godly, he says, is because they have a resemblance of what some of my characteristics stand for. But they haven't made me their Lord that drives why they do those characteristics. And in the same turn, the ungodly characteristics that we've addressed, some we haven't addressed, is part of their M.O. But the adversary is lord over those ungodly characteristics. And they're still driven to living by those as well. And let those be their source, which is why they have not submitted or committed or dedicated themselves to him as their lord. That'll make you chew right there for a minute. Makes you, some probably got to really grip that for a moment. But, he's, but here's, here's the thing what the writer says. He says, there are those that have a form of godliness. They got a little bit of his character. But they deny the power thereof. And in this, here's, here's, here's a power stroke to this message. I had to look at that word deny very closely. Amen. So I hope everybody pays very close attention to me on this thing, deny. Uh, the Greek word that Paul uses here is arnomai. And arnomai means to reject. It means to act unlike oneself. And it also means to contradict. Let me say that again, because I really want those that are listening to me to get this, because it's very profound. Why you are not in the power and the truth of the Lord because of ungodly character. And it's because of denial. When you deny in this context that's being used here, it means you reject, you contradict, or you are unlike the self that you're supposed to be. So, so he says, when you're operating in these ungodly characteristics, you can't serve God in manner too. You, you can't be on both sides of the fence doing all these ungodly characteristics, but then yet you want to do the godly characteristics as well. He, that's why the definition means that you contradict. That's why the, the definition means that you're rejecting godly characteristics when you live and operate in an accepted means of operating in ungodly character. Why are you doing your ungodly thing? You're saying, right now, I turn off and I reject what's godly. And so now, based on what I've done, I live my life uh, uh, in a contradiction because I want to be good on Sunday. I want to be good in Bible study. I want to be good when I'm seen in front of other believers. But yet, I turn that off. And when I'm not in the presence of the light, I'll still operate in darkness with those who accept ungodly character. So what happens, I flip the script and I'm not in the character. Meaning the Lord God says, you, 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 ain't, you ain't yourself today. 
That, that's what the Lord God says when he sees you. When you claim that you're his child, but then you're doing ungodly self, he says you're not yourself today. You, that's why we need spiritual medication. Because it's meant to help us begin to come to ourselves. I believe David said uh, in the book of Psalms, when I came to myself. It's because what happens is ungodly character means you're not yourself. Now, there's something else that I tie to that because in this, the Lord had me go back and, and like I said here a few moments ago, really look at what denying is all about. And he said, the reason that you're not yourself, the reason that you contradict my character, the reason that you reject my character and get back in ungodly character is because you didn't do the prerequisite. What am I referring to as the prerequisite? Well, for those that are Bible readers, when you read Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus said, when you deny yourself and pick up your cross, then follow me. Some of us have not denied ourselves, but we're trying to follow him. Okay, let me carry you a little bit further on denial. I told you here in 2 Timothy, arnomai mm -hmm. is the Greek word for deny, to reject, to not be yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Here in Matthew 16, 24, there is a preposition that's in front of Apomai, or should I say Arnomai, which is ap Arnomai. Now, something as simple as two letters begins to shift the meaning to be a little bit deeper. If I can give it to you, here's the thing. Ap Arnomai means to affirm no acquaintance. It means, watch this, to forget one's self. It means to disown or to reject. It means to abstain or to separate from. Now listen to what I'm saying here. When Jesus said in Matthew for you to deny yourself, he says you got to first affirm that you have no acquaintance with your character. When Jesus said deny yourself, he said you got to forget yourself or the character of who you've been. When he said deny yourself, he says you got to disown you. And reject you, which means disown or reject the character that you've been living. When he said deny yourself, he said you got to abstain or separate from the character of you. What was it that the very first verse of chapter 3 said perilous times will come? Meaning in the time of abstaining. In the time of you abstaining from you on the journey. The journey starts with you, but you're supposed to be left as you're continuing the journey towards him. There's something about you in your character that's got to be left at the starting line so that when you get to the finish line, it's not you anymore. It's the character of him. But the thing is, you can't be successful of carrying your cross of being in a relationship with him if you don't understand that you got to leave you behind. That's why what happens is the power of the Lord God leaves you 
because you continue to walk a journey that you do some of the characteristics of him, but you don't want to let you go. You, you're still wrapped up with self that you just can't let self die in the process. You want Jesus to live, but yet you want you to live as well. You can't have your cake, ice cream, and eat them all too. Something has to be let go in the process, and it's you. But what I'm saying is how you let you go is you got to cut your ungodly character. He said, this is why, this is why you're not getting there. He says, you deny, you live a life of rejecting godliness. You live a life of contradicting godly character. You live a life that's unlike yourself of what you're supposed to be in me because you never denied you. So watch this. It, it carries us to these last two verses. In this message, I pray everybody still with me that you learn in this morning. Watch this. This is what he says. He says, for of this sort are they which creep into the houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, even learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, some may be listening to me right now and say, okay, man of God, break this down. What is that really saying? Now, I know some people read those verses and you default to the natural. You lose the spiritual conversation. You begin to look and say, it's them women that made me do it. We, we begin to default to the female gender here, right? Some, some when, when they read this for the first time, but if I, if I can give you some revelation and some illumination... What Paul now is doing is eluding to Eve in the garden. Are y'all hearing me? Paul is not making an accusation against female gender. Paul is bringing a reminder to our attention how the character of the adversary creeps in like what happened in the Garden of Eden. Now that you've got that mindset, watch this. He says, for of this sort are they which creep into the houses. Meaning of this characteristic or, or, or character type of individuals, they are like serpents which creep into the house. Creeping in, watch this, it's not just tiptoeing in unseen. Creeping in in the Greek also means to interject yourself. So, so it's saying that it's this type of ungodly character that has a serpent mentality to edge itself in the life of individuals who the individuals are meant to be the households of God. Now, watch this. He says, they creep in or interject themselves into the houses. Watch this. Houses being the dwelling place and houses being the family. The Lord God is talking about his family. He says, this is, how, this is how you get separated from me because the adversary is still working in you through ungodly character. And the way that he works with ungodly character is as a serpent still creeping in and dividing your family, dividing your household, dividing you being in the household of the Lord God because you don't see it coming as the serpent in the garden. And so watch this. He says, uh, uh, coming in and leading captive silly women. What is he saying here? He says they are leading into bondage. Watch this. Ungodly character is what puts you in bondage. 
Ungodly character is what causes you to sin. Ungodly character is what causes you to entertain pride. Ungodly character is what causes you to think in an ungodly manner and opens up yourself to being conducive, to being deceived, to being tricked, to being hoodwinked, to being pulled out of godly character and now put in bondage or captivity. Because see, now that you're in captivity, watch this, captivity means you're restrained, bondage means now you're stuck working in it. Now, let, me, let me make sure you got that crystal clear. When you're in bondage, it means you're working according to what you have now been incarcerated in or have been captured that now limits your freedom. So he says ungodly character is what causes you to be bound. Watch this. He says, as the silly, silly women, foolish women, which, once again, when we look back at Eve in the garden, that is how it happened. So, so really, even though Paul makes uh, an, an accusation or eludes towards Eve in the garden, right now it's not even gender-specific. Whether you male or female, we allow ungodly character to creep in through other folks or through us. And it causes us once again to be in the bondage that we find ourselves. And so now that we're in the bondage, it causes us to now bear the weight, as it says, the load of sin, which leads us away. It leads us away. It's what causes us to go into our own lust, which means our forbidden desires. I hope somebody's listening to me right now. Wow, ungodly character has this much power in my life? Yes, ungodly character gives you unrighteous power against righteous power that's given to you being in godly character. What does he say in this last verse? He said, we're already led away by diverse, meaning multiple types of lust, multiple types of ungodly desires that don't match the character of godliness. But what's interesting is he says, while you're still entertaining ungodly character, you're still learning, but yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Hmm. What does he mean by that? He says you're still learning to, to mean understanding but now watch this. That is a understanding. But it says that you never come to the knowledge, which knowledge is understanding, which is on the greater level. Meaning you never understand the truth. Why is it that you never understand the truth? Well, since Paul, as I gave you a revelation, brings us to the picture of the Garden of Eden. The reason that you never are able to come to the knowledge of the truth is because as long as you're in ungodly character, you're still eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, this, this might have some really gritting their teeth right now. Let, let, me, let me bring some, some, some more revelation to you. When you go back and you look in Genesis and it talks about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's implying the tree of understanding what's good versus what's evil. We still have a scientific mind, if I, if I can say, how do things work? We want to know everything about a thing, but we're not looking to know the knowledge of God behind what we want to know. 
Hear, hear me very clearly. So, so what happens is he says we're forever learning. We're forever in a natural mindset of getting information and understanding it in the natural context, but we never come to the knowledge or the understanding of it in the spiritual. Because, see, the spiritual was the tree of life. The spiritual was eating of the fruit that was meant to give us life eternal in spiritual things. But since we got deceived by ungodly character since the days of the garden, what Paul brings to our attention is that ungodly character is still bringing deception to us as we continue to eat and munch like we eating Frito-Lays, like we eating cakes and cookies and pies. We're still eating it as a sweet tooth that we're trying to satisfy, but in the midst of us being greedy and still eating the knowledge or the understanding of the world, he says you never can and come into the knowledge or the understanding of spiritual things, which is your truth. That is the reality that is meant for you based upon the spirit. But what happens, you're continually being blinded by eating and partaking of ungodly character that now continues to operate in your life. And that ungodly character now has you in a place that you can't see me. You can't see me. So this is where I, where I leave this on this morning. As I reiterate the title, don't let ungodly character deny you of godly power and truth. We cannot afford to continue to feed our ungodly character to cause us to miss our maturing in the character of God. We can't afford to continue to feed our flesh and miss the power or the ability of God so truth can be revealed to us for our glorified form in him. Amen. 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 And amen. Praise the Lord.